Hello, this is Harvey Ambrose, and I am preaching this message to listeners of the radio station in Monrovia, Liberia, under the auspices of Missionary Baptist Voice of Africa, continuing our lessons from the Gospel according to John, and we are in chapter 18 of John and verse 38, which reads, Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews, and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. But ye have a custom, that I should release unto you one at the Passover. Will ye therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? They Then cried they all again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers platted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto him, Behold, I bring him forth to you that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. <clears throat> now the last time uh, I tried to preach, I ended with verse 38 where it says, where Pilate asked Christ, What is truth? I will not try to re-preach that, uh, but we're going to continue on. And I think it's important to note that in the gospel according to John, there is no uh, there is no uh, record written uh, concerning how Pilate, uh, having learned that Christ was as it was supposed uh, from Galilee, he was not, but he did grow up there. That he was that Jesus was in the jurisdiction of Herod the king, and not Pilate, and so Pilate seemingly very reluctant to judge Christ and and if no for no other reason uh, God had in a dream of Pilate's wife so God sent to Pilate's wife a dream uh, whereby she was made to know that Jesus was a righteous man if not more than that who knows what all was in the dream but she reported to her husband that he had best have nothing to do with with punishing this righteous man. She warned him and she told of the dream. God had appeared to her and no doubt that that probably was on Pilate's mind. The awkwardness of the Jews coming uh, on the morning uh, who, which evening became the Passover early in the morning maybe unbefittingly early with someone and they don't even enter into his house on the pretext that they can't go there or else they'd make themselves unclean on the Passover and uh, send Christ bound unto him and everything that he has heard from them versus what he has heard from Christ shows Christ I think to be true and them to be false and Pilate, being a, uh, a Roman, a pagan, if not an atheist, uh, a representative of the power of this world, which at that time was Tiberius Caesar, appointed by Caesar as governor, or maybe more accurately, prefect in Judea, he was responsible uh, to judge. He was made a judge over these people on matters of capital punishment. And, you know, Rome had a law, and it was not a bad law. They were, they had uh, a very highly developed civilization. You know, perhaps the greatest of all civilizations, even up to and including our own. If you study the Romans, you'll learn that they were no 
unsophisticated group of people. Their judicial system was was uh, catered around the concept of, of fairness and non-prejudice. And a, uh, a ruler, a judge over such a trial, was required by their law to render justice. If a person cannot be proven guilty, then he must be acquitted and not punished. On the other hand, if he had been proven guilty, he must be punished and not acquitted. Really, the judge's hands were tied in these matters, but we'll learn that uh, Pilate had, uh, had not as high a regard for that law as he should. But at this early point, he wanted to give Jesus uh, the benefit of the doubt and hear his side, not just the charges against him. And he is credited for that. I think it's to his credit that he did so. He spoke to Christ. He learned that uh, even though Christ uh, did allege himself to be king of the Jews, but that his kingdom was not of this world, it was from another world, it was from another place, and, and that his servants would fight if his kingdom was of this world. But since it was not of this world, his servants did not fight to prevent him being delivered <clears throat> by the Jews uh, to Pilate. And he also acknowledged that he was a king and born to that end. And that he also came into this world, meaning he's from another world. He came into this world to bear witness of truth. And that everyone that is of the truth hears his voice. And Pilate had no doubt been pricked in his heart because Jesus here was trying to save Pilate, as he did with all people. He, he not only spoke the words that needed to be spoken audibly, but Jesus, I mean, no, never man spake like Jesus Christ. And the words that he speaks in a voice not heard by human ears go straight to the heart, straight to the, the spirit that is within each person with whom Jesus deals. And the Bible teaches that he deals with all. A few chapters before this, Jesus says, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, and by then it says it means he, he would be crucified. If I'm crucified, he says, and he was, I will draw all men unto me. Now there's meaning in that. And we don't, you know, I don't have time to get too far into the meaning of it, but take it as true because Jesus said it. That's enough for every one of us. He said it. He said he would draw all men. And since all men don't exist all at the same time, and the drawing is obviously not something that is physical, it's something that is inward, because it is the inward man that has to be saved, that has to be born again from above, from, from that other world that Jesus had told Pilate about. It's a, it's a drawing of the Spirit of God sent by Christ into the human heart to bring about repentance so that a person does not have to die in their sins but, but can avail themselves uh, of the grace of God in Jesus Christ and, and the sacrifice that He made to pay for our sins. Jesus, knowing Pilate's heart and knowing He was lost, is working on the man hours before His death. Before Christ dies, while he has yet time, he says, I'm the light of the world, and I have to work while it's light. He still has time to work to save Pilate, whom he knew was going to hand him over to crucifixion. I don't think Pilate knew that yet. I don't think Pilate knew that he was going to ultimately... Uh, cave in to the demands of the of the Pharisees whose sin was far greater than Pilate's because they knew what they were doing and Pilate, he had no malicious intent towards Christ. He he was not sitting around plotting on Jesus. He had no no bone to pick with this man. He was the, the governor or the prefect of, of Judea and his job, amongst other things, was to judge capital crimes. And so he goes about it even-handed and Jesus works on his heart. And at this last, when he says to Jesus, what is truth? 
he's basically denying the drawing that Christ is placing in his heart to know more about him, to more than know about him. This is a phrase we use too often. It's knowing him that matters, not knowing about him. It's great to know about Jesus. I can't learn too much about him, but that's not the same as knowing him. There are many people in the world that, that, that are ever learning about Him, but never coming to the personal knowledge of the man, of the God, the man-God, the God-man, Jesus Christ. You don't know Him unless you have been drawn by Him, and He draws all men into Him at one time or another. And, and rather than fighting the drawing, you yield you, you, you submit to the work of God. Salvation is of God. There's nothing you can do. There are things you can do against it. Others teach you cannot. I believe it is irresist. I believe it is resistible as opposed to an irresistible drawing. Uh, the the, the, the uh, deacon Stephen said as much uh, under inspiration of God as he preached to these very same people uh, telling them even though their consciences were pricked they had been drawn to repentance by Christ by God himself and the person of Christ through the spirit of God he says ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did now now, if the Holy Ghost only acted on those that were going to be saved, then obviously they could not always resist. They would have to ultimately yield. But they, they did resist, and they resisted to the death. They died in their sins. Jesus had told these people that they would die in their sins. He wasn't happy about it. He, he, he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but He knew the hearts of them, and He knew the future because He knows all things. Jesus knows all things. Always has. Always will. He knows what's in man, what's in each person. And he looked in the hearts of these people that he had over and over drawn to himself with words of grace and mercy and truth. And yet they rejected him and they hated him. And he knew the future and he knew they would not be saved. So he said, ye shall die in your sins. It was a sad pronouncement. There was no joy in the saying of because he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But I'm not going to get anywhere if I keep it at this pace. So we go forward. So, 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 so back to what I tried to say. There is no account in John, the Gospel of John, which is, uh, which is recounted elsewhere uh, where Pilate trying to get out from under uh, this burden of having to be the one to judge whether Jesus lives or dies, which is his job, but trying to escape it like most of us try to get out of, out of bad jobs or dirty jobs that we don't want to do. This was a bad job that he did not want to do. His wife warned him against it. God warned him through his wife and through the presentiment that was in his heart. As he heard the words of Jesus uh, drawing him to truth. He rebelled against truth. But rather than pronounce in anger against Christ, he sent him to King Herod. And I'm not going to get into what happened with Herod. But, but Herod heard nothing from Jesus because Herod had no true interest in truth whatsoever. I think Pilate had some interest in it. As we can see as we develop this. But but or as the Lord has developed it in the writing, and as we, as we hear it, if we have ears to hear it, Pilate was reasonably, or at least uh, by, by placing him up against the Jewish rulers, he was a far more righteous man. And also more righteous than Herod, who was, who, who, who was a man with a dead spirit, who had absolutely uh, nothing in his heart for God. He had put to death John the Baptist. He believed Jesus was John the Baptist come back from the dead, thereby undoing the wicked thing that he had done, or so he thought. He wanted Jesus to do some tricks for him. And Jesus never said a word to him, never did a thing to him. So Herod had his, his soldiers mock him. And they put on him a gorgeous robe, it says. And I believe it's the very purple robe that we read about in uh, chapter 19, verse 2. 
that the soldiers put on him. I think they took the robe off, scourged him, and then put the robe back on to mock him. So that's where I think the robe came from. And I believe that between, right here in chapter 38, where it says, Pilate said unto him, what is truth? We probably need to put a giant parenthesis because I believe it is at that point that Pilate sends him to Herod. And then he comes back from Herod, and I'm sure Pilate is not too happy about that. He was probably hoping that Herod would let him go or judge him in some way and take the onus of that responsibility from Pilate himself. But back he comes. He's already been abused physically by, Pilate, or by Herod's soldiers. He's been ridiculed by this, this gorgeous robe that Herod had put on him, not out of love, but out of mockery. And now he's back. And so it says, that when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews. So he goes back. See, they're not coming in. They're still not coming in where Pilate is, into the judgment hall. He has to go back and forth to these people. And he goes back to them again. And he says, I find in him no fault at all. He's saying, I question him. I just got through talking to the man. I sent him to Herod. He comes back. Herod has found nothing wrong or he would not have sent him back to me. And I find no fault. You, you wanted me to judge this man. I find no fault in him. Four times, Pilate says, he's innocent. Four times, the Jews have, have no regard for that. And ultimately, Pilate despite his knowledge of the innocency of Christ, falls to fear and cowardice of what's going to happen to him if he turns Jesus loose. And so he allows him to be punished. But that's getting ahead. But he says, here's, here's one more thing he thinks. So he says to them, uh, you have a custom. I find no fault, but you have a custom that I release someone to you at the Passover. Well, here it was. He needed to release someone. He's under the assumption that these people are not morally completely insane. He says, here's this man, Parabas. He's a robber. In another place it says uh, that he was a brigand or, or something along that. It means he was, he was, uh, he was a highwayman. He, he probably killed people for money. He, he was a marauder of some sort. This man is not good. He didn't just steal somebody's food. He was a brigand and known to be a robber. He's a violent man is the connotation given by other description mom and the other gospels. He says, how about, what do you think? Should I, should I let this, this, this brigand loose, this, this man who, who is obviously known and has evil report among you, None of you like him. No one should. He's awful. Uh, do you want him or, or do you want me to release Jesus? I think he thought that their answer would be, well, given that choice, sure, uh, better release Jesus. But he had no idea the extent to which the devil had put hatred in the hearts of these people against Jesus. They hated him because he spoke truth to their lies. They hated him because the people loved him and they did not love uh, themselves. They, they did not love their religious rulers like they loved Jesus. They hated him because he had the very power of God and they had nothing. They hated him because every attempt they had uh, attempted to, to kill him, he had somehow or other evaded every one of those. They, 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 they hated him because they knew that every word he spoke was true and it made a liar out of he, They hated him because he told the truth about them to other people. He told them, everyone, that they were hypocrites, that they were snakes, that they were whited graves, that, that everything about them was corrupt and false, and that, and that, you know, they, that people should not be like them. They should be otherwise than their religious rulers. Well, high-placed religious people don't like to be called sinners. And they, didn't, they hated Jesus for it. So, so no, absolutely. They, they said, no, no, no do, not this man. Don't, don't let Jesus loose, but let Barabbas loose. Let, let this obvious criminal loose. 
So it says, Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. Now you know, it says, Therefore he did it. He had not yet passed judgment that Jesus is going to be crucified. And these people would not, I think he was shocked that they did not release uh, Jesus as opposed to Barabbas. But they did not. And here was a big mistake that he made. By, by saying, well, how about one, uh, either Jesus or Barabbas, well, who was the judge now? Who, who finally had the authority as to which one would be crucified? Well, he gave it to the mob. Pilate, maybe not knowing or you know, making the wrong assumption about what the mob was going to say, he said, well, which one do you want me to release? Well, essentially, he gave them the power to decide which one, assuming it would be Jesus released. It was not. Well, now he's painted himself into a corner, and, and he has no, no good options. It, and so he's trying to think of, of some means whereby he can still set Jesus free. He was determined to do it. We read in the book of Acts that he was determined to let Jesus go, but the Pharisees would not let him. I think Pilate gets a bad rap uh, today as people uh, tried to talk about him as being so bad. It says, Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. Well, back in that day, it was considered acceptable to torture people into telling the truth. He was accused of something. He had, he had not, uh, you know, he had answered the charges, but not in any way that Pilate could find guilt in him. And so it would have been a fairly common thing on questioning a witness to have them whipped, thinking that under torture they might, they might confess to some to some crime that they had done. I think that's that's my opinion, but I think that's why he scourged him. We read in other places it was 39 lashes. It was a terrible punishment. And that the soldiers, given the ability to do that, uh, not only did that, but they, they took a crown of thorns and, and mashed it down on his head. They put the purple robe on him, I believe, that came from Herod. And they mocked him. They said, Hail, King of the Jews. They smote him with their hands. And then Pilate, it says, therefore. Again, this therefore. So it's connected with this, with this flogging that he took. Because of that, Pilate went forth again. And saith unto him, Behold, I, find, uh, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. So, as I read the text, it would appear that that Pilate, trying to make sure that he has thoroughly investigated this, and he can tell them so, and then Christ never changes. He never said another word, you know, for a while. From the, from the time he told them about everyone that is of the truth, heareth my voice. We've not heard one, one word from Christ. And now he's beaten. Still no word. He has not confessed to any wrongdoing. So he says, see, I've, I've beaten him. I've tortured him. The thing that we do... He has still not confessed. So he says, I bring him forth to you that ye may know, having beaten him, I think, having beaten him, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Then, So he brings him, he says, then Jesus came forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate saith unto, him, unto them, Behold the man. You know, I'm, I have often preached that. Many people have. And I guess it's not the place now, but that is good advice that came from the lips of Pontius Pilate. It behooves all people, because Jesus does indeed draw all people to him. All people thus drawn to Christ through an action of the Spirit in their hearts, in their spirits, God working directly on you, to, to bring you from a state of sin and death to a state of grace and life, to take a dead soul and, and replace it with a living one from above, something newly made, a new creature, all this available, <clears throat> he instructs us that, 
that to find that we have to look to Jesus. Throughout the Old Testament and New, there, there's just one after another reference. You know, Moses lifted up the serpent as a type of Christ. That whoever looked upon the snake, the brass snake on a, on a, on a pole, uh, would be healed of the bite of, of physical fiery serpents. And Jesus said to Nicodemus, it's like that. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, I have to be lifted. I have to be crucified. And the, the obvious image meaning you got to look to me. And in Isaiah, it says, Look unto me uh, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is none else. He's saying, you've got to look to me. To people who, who were uh, burdened down with sin and, 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 and consumed with death and darkness because, because there was no light in them. And they had heavy hearts because of this, because they'd been around Jesus and heard Him preach. And I tell you, when you're lost and, and Jesus works on your heart, it gets heavier and heavier and, and, and feels more and more remorse and, and more and more fear and trouble about, about what might come to pass if you die in that state. The, Jesus works on your heart to reveal truth, the truth of your condition, uh, the truth of your standing before Him. And the truth is a horrible death and, and punishment forever if you, if you can't find them. And so, so he says to these people thus burdened down like you are as he draws you. If you, if you let him draw, if you, don't, if you don't fight against him, if he draws you down, he says, come unto me. Come to me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden. He's talking about under the weight of sin. I'll give you rest. See, everything has to do with looking to Christ for salvation. Looking to Christ for life. Looking to Christ, because you don't have any. Your body lives, but your spirit is dead to God. It takes a new spirit that, that, that is alive to God and dead to sin. And only God supplies that. It, it's not a thing. It's not just changing yours, sprucing it up or something. The old man is crucified with Christ. And it raises with him a new man. It's mystical. You don't understand it, but I'm, I'm telling you the truth of it. You must die to the world. Die to sin. Your heart has to die to that. It has to have such slight regard of it. It has to become in, in such contempt of self that you deny yourself and look to Jesus for help. And if you behold him, that one that was mocked and, and beaten and scourged and, and thorns on his brow and, and, and wounds all over him, bruised for our iniquity, where by his stripes were healed, a lamb led to the slaughter for us so that we could have life from the dead. Behold the man and live. That's what it means. You can't see him with eyes of flesh. You can't, you can't understand him with a brain of flesh and blood. He is not to be understood by the knowledge of men. Uh, in God's wisdom, uh, men cannot come to him through their wisdom. It is, it is by the, the actions of God in the spirit of men that people are made to, to repent and to trust and to live in Christ Jesus. Because that man that, that Pilate spoke about is everything to us. Life itself. Resurrection. Glory. Hope. Eternal life. All good things. But it's not found by our works. It's not found by our knowledge. Except for our personal knowledge of Him that can only be accomplished by Him through the Holy Spirit that He works in our hearts and draws us to Himself. Behold the man. We'll go on. When the chief priests therefore and officers saw Him, they cried out, saying, Crucify! Crucify! Can't you just hear Him? Pilate says to him, You take Him and crucify Him! I find no fault in Him! Listen to this man. We're, we're taught that the Romans were such bad people. And I'm not saying they're good. There's none good. 
But there's some worse than others, and Jesus says so. These religious rulers who, who had the very oracles of God, who had the Old Testament Scriptures, and who, who locked it up in themselves. They didn't want the Gentile dogs to have anything. They were so self-righteous and, and so full of themselves that they, they hated all the Gentile world. And truth be told, they hated their own people. That's why their people didn't like them. It's obvious they may have said they did, but it was obvious they did not. That's why Christ was so refreshing to the Israelites there. Why the, why the people loved Him is because His love was sincere. They knew it. They felt it. It was clear to them. And the, and the despite that the religious rulers had for the common Jews could not be hidden from them either. You take him and crucify. There is no fault in this man, Pilate says. Man, I mean, it's almost like a hero. But as all human heroes, they are yet human. They are yet flawed. And unfortunately, Pilate was too. The Jews answered, we have a law. By our law, he, he ought to die because he makes himself the son of God. They're, they're talking about Leviticus, uh, no doubt, uh, probably uh, Leviticus chapter 24, verse 16, where it, it's, it's the law against blaspheming God. And truly, had Jesus not been God, he would have been blasphemy because he clearly presented himself as one with God, the son of God, one with God. Everything uh, he saw God, the Father do, he did. And, and the Father did everything with Christ. They shared everything. They were, he said, me and the Father are one. Well, that was blasphemy to them because they wanted it to be. Because they wanted to resist the drawing of the Spirit on their heart as Jesus preached to them. Because they preferred themselves to God. They would not have Christ rule over them. It says, When Pilate therefore heard that saying, what saying? Well, the saying is, he made himself the son of God. Well, now, before they had said he makes himself a king. You know, and they say, oh, well, he stirs up the people. And, you know, ridiculous charges, which Pilate knew were not true. All he had to do was look at the man. Behold the man. You could, you could see him beaten. And he's still quiet. He's still not usurping any authority. He's submitting to all things. It's like, how could you think this man standing there with a bloody purple robe and, and, and blood streaming from thorns in his brow, how could you think such a man to be any danger to you? He's appealing to their conscience. He's hoping that looking at him alone would be enough. To soften the hearts of these hard-hearted Pharisees and Sadducees. All the scribes, all the, all the lawyers, all the ones who hated him so much. But it didn't. Instead, it evoked from them something that they probably never wanted Pilate to know. But because it came out, out it comes. They said, well, he makes himself the son of God. Whoa. Now see, Pilate was a Roman. They had false gods, but by this time, most of them probably were atheists. They gave lip service. You know, they would they would make sacrifices to the gods somehow because that was that was part of Roman tradition that had been around a long time. And and in that tradition, particularly, there used to be a, a, an understanding that that their false gods had children. And it talked about those, you know, all those ancient legends of, of the son of Zeus and the son of this and that and, you know, all that stuff. And, and as children, they were taught those stories, much like we're taught about Santa Claus. And, and just like we grew out of believing in Santa Claus sometime in our life, I hope, you know, well, they kind of grew out of believing in sons of God. But now these people say that Jesus not just makes himself to be a king, Pilate's hearing now from them that he says he's the son of God. And you know, Pilate has been talking to Jesus and Jesus has been talking to Pilate. He's been saying, yeah, I have a kingdom, but it's not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight, but, but it's not from there. He says, you're saying I'm a king? Yeah, you're right, I'm a king. 
I was born to this. And, and I came to bear witness of truth. Don't you want to know some truth, Pilate? All these things were working on Pilate. And now he hears from these Jews that Jesus says he's the Son of God. And right there, right there, boy, that got a hold of him. He was more afraid. He was afraid of dealing with this man because of the dream that was sent to his wife. He was afraid of because he knew it was wrong to punish this man. Because he himself over and over and over said... I find no fault in him. He was innocent and he knew it. He, he, for him to murder, the, it'd be murder to judge him guilty when he knew he was innocent. He was afraid. But now he says he's the son of God. And suddenly those childhood stories come back. A son of God. I never believed that kind of stuff of these silly gods, these Greek gods and Roman gods that had kids. It's ridiculous, but here this man is. There's something about this man. No one ever spake like him. No one ever acted like him. No, There's nobody like him. He's different. I can tell it. I feel it. I know it. I can't put my finger on it, but he's not like anybody else. Poor Pilate. He's, he's afraid because now he's thinking, maybe, maybe there's something to this. What if he is the son of God? Like, the, like he says, he, they say he says he is. And he comes out with this question. He's the more afraid. It says he went into the judgment hall. He says to Jesus, whence art thou? It means, where have you come from? Well, he knew that he came from Galilee. It's not like he's, talk, he's not talking about a physical place. He knew where he came from. He sent him to Herod because it was Herod's jurisdiction. And that didn't work. He's asking this because he's wanting to know. In his heart, he's beginning to understand that Jesus is not of this world. So he wants to know what world. Where are you from? Where does something like you, somebody that, that I can't look at without, without feeling this grip on my heart, I can't ask intelligent questions of you. When I ask something, you come back with an answer that, that just tears my heart out. And it shouldn't, but it does. I don't know what to do with you. Where are you from? Why, from where did this power that you that you exert on my heart come from? Boy, that's a question all of us should ask. When the Lord draws us to Him according to the promise that He would draw all men. Some of you hearing this pitiful sermon. Maybe the Lord is dealing with your heart. Maybe you're religious. Maybe you know all about what it says about Jesus. But nothing's ever happened to your heart. He's never really, he's never really dealt with it, right? Or, or you've rejected it or, or something's wrong. You know it is because you may know about him, but you know that you don't know him. You've not met him. He's not spoken a word to you. You have not heard the voice of the Son of God and lived. Like Jesus said, that all who hear his voice live. Even now. The, the time is coming and now is, he says, when the dead, spiritually dead, hear, hear the voice of the Son of God. Now he's drawn you, but has he spoken to your heart? He told Pilate, he says, everyone that's of the truth hears my voice. Have you heard his voice? Pilate heard his physical voice. And I think the drawing is working on his heart. Where are you from? Are you God? I know you're a king. You say you're a king. You're from another world. Where are you? That's the best question Pilate's ever asked. He first says, he first says to him, are you a king? No, my kingdom's not of this world. I'm a king, but not of this world. He says, what have you done in another place? What is it that you've done? These people, your own people, are. what have you done? And then he finally says, what is truth? I mean, there are questions and, and Jesus responds to all of them except for the what is truth. See, why did he not respond to that question? Because he, he had already impressed upon Pilate's heart what was true. He was true. Christ was true. And Pilate knew it. 
but he was rejecting it. Why repeat himself? And the same thing happens here. He finally asked this best question, where are you from? You know, he said, he told him earlier, he says, and for this cause came I into this world, the world. He said, if I came to this world for a cause, it means he was not of this world. And he told him he was not of this world. He's from another world. And, and so now Pilate says, well, where? And Pilate gets no answer at all. It says, but Jesus gave him no answer. Well, now, why not? I mean, we can speculate. I think there's some truth. And I think he's eventually answered. But it's for the same reason, I think, that he didn't answer what is truth. In other words, Pilate was beginning to be affected by Christ, but just when it started to the point of something that could benefit him truly, he would deflect somewhere else. Well, what's truth? And he goes off, see? Just when his heart gets troubled, he flees. I think that is the fate of most human beings on this earth. When the Spirit begins to draw you to Christ, when Jesus draws you through the Spirit of God, to come to Him with your heavy burden of sin, to turn back to your God, who, who even if you were an atheist like I was for so long, somehow you know, somehow you know. Well, I'll tell you how you know it's God that puts it on your heart to know He's He said eternity in your heart. You know. Your mind rebels. You don't believe it, but but you know. You're afraid of the grave because you know. You, you know that there's got to be a punishment for sin or there's no justice anywhere. You know. But your mind keeps you away and you and you dodge and you and you deflect from, from the work of God. You do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your professors at college do, as your parents did, as your friends did, so do ye. But yet the only way you can be saved is to not resist the Spirit of Christ working in your heart. Where you come from? Well, he knew. He already knew. He, he was already feeling this, this presentiment that was in, in Pilate's heart. He had heard about uh, the dream his wife had from God. He'd been warned and he knew it. His own eyes saw the innocence of this man. His own heart felt the drawing of this man to truth and to that, that world that transcends the world here to which Christ had submitted himself to be under its power for the good of this world. Pilate knew the answer to the question. He knew that Christ was from God. He knew that Christ was God. That's why he feared when they said, he says he's the son of God. And it says Pilate was the more afraid. Now he's not just dealing with the king of the Jews that says he's got a kingdom from some other world. He's dealing with God and, and Pilate is scared to death. Would you be if you had to judge such a man? But you do. He stands before you. He stands before everyone that he draws, and he draws everyone. At some point, you have to determine what you will think of this man. What you will do with this man. What, what will you do? Will you flee? Will you deflect? We just, you know, he's already told you the truth. And yet you say, well, give me some more truth. Well, I may give you some more. And it's like, well, well, tell me about, and finally he just shuts up. You've heard all you need to hear. If you're not going to listen to what he tells you, why does he need to tell you more? His silence is profound. And sometimes it's permanent. He says, I will not always strive with men. He will not always strive with you. He will strive with you, but not always. Either, either he wins you in repentance and faith, or you die in your sins. There may come a time long before you die physically where he will cease to strive with you. Well, he had not ceased with Pilate, but he was right up against it. 
Pilate asked a question he wouldn't answer because Pilate knew the answer in his heart and Jesus knew his heart and he knew that Pilate knew that he was dealing with something special, something unworldly, something that mattered, something having to do with truth, something having to do with God, something having to do with real power, something having to do with real life. He knew it, he felt it, it was in him. But he could not yield to that. Because after all, he's Pilate. He's a Roman. He's the governor. He's the prefect sent from Tiberius. He had to judge. He, he was aloof from these things. He could not break down. Not before all these people. Not before this man that looks like some kind of a beggar that he had just beaten the crap out of. Just to prove a point. Pilate's scared. And Jesus does not answer him. But Pilate keeps on talking. His pride's starting to get him now. He's starting to get a little... He, he takes umbrage at this silence. He says, Pilate says to him, Speakest thou not to me? Are you not going to answer me? What's wrong with you, Jesus? I've asked you a question. Where are you from? I want to know. He would already already knew. Don't you know? I have power to crucify. I have power to release. Don't you? Are you so ignorant, Jesus? Don't you know? If you just answer my question, I'll let you go. Well, Jesus knew. He was not ignorant. But he also was aware of more than Pilate himself because Pilate had already relinquished his judgment to the mob. The mob said, release Barabbas and crucify Christ. Pilate gave him that, that option and they exercised it. He really had no power to turn him down now and he knew it. It was beginning to dawn on him. Jesus, But he says, don't you know? All you got to do is answer my question and, and I'll let you go. That's the implication of it. Now Jesus comes back and he does answer because Pilate had addressed a thing that needed to be understood, not just by Pilate, by all the rulers of this world. He said, to him, thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore, he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. Man, there's so much there. I wish I had more time, but I'll try to talk. I know it's going to be another long sermon, but he says, first off, he's not saying you have no power. Jesus is not telling Pilate you have no power. He's 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 saying, yeah, you do. You do have power, and it's not just power. It's power that was given to you from above. The power you have, Pilate, is not something that comes of your own accord because you're so, so wonderful. It was given you by God. You have power given you by God. He's letting Pilate know and all the rulers of this world that their power does not come of their own birth. It comes of God. God rules in the affairs of this world. Sometimes he sets up rulers that do evil things. But not because God is evil. But because, well, in the counsels of God that we don't know, all I know is that his, his desire is that people repent and be saved. And he allows things to happen that puts people in a state of sorrow in their heart. It can be war. It can be death of any sort. Loss of loved ones. Loss of wealth. Loss of property. Loss of your health. All these things combine and work on people to bring them to their moral senses and, 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 and a desire to seek God. He uses troubled hearts. He uses circumstances to bring trouble to people's hearts sorrow to their hearts, sent by God, so that their hearts are susceptible to Him drawing them to repentance. He's letting Pilate know that yes, you have power. It's power from God. And you justly have power over this piece of flesh standing before you, except for the fact that because because God's given you that power. You know, He has given Rome power over these people, these Jews. God gave it to them. He gave it to Tiberius. Tiberius gave it to Pilate. And God, God is behind that. 
But Pilate has, you know, Pilate says, I have power to crucify. I have power to release. Not true. Under Roman law, the only power he had was to determine guilt or innocence. If, if, if Christ were guilty, he had no power under the law to acquit him. If Christ were innocent, he had no power at all under Roman law to crucify him. See, Pilate did not have the power he thought he would. So since Christ was innocent, even though Pilate had power from God, he would have no power over Christ in particular because he's an innocent man except God had granted him even that. See, the thing is, Christ had to die for the ungodly. Christ died for sinners. See, the only way anyone in this world could be, uh, you know, Jesus begged him in the garden, if there be any other way, let this cup pass. But there was no other way. All things are possible with God. But it was not right with God that, that men should somehow live despite being sinful and there be no punishment for sin. Someone had to die. Someone had to pay the price of sin and, and it, was, it was the very Son of God, the, the Word of God that, that became a Son in time, born of a virgin, made flesh, the, the Word of God that made all that there is, the Creator of all things, equal with God, is God. Became flesh, born of a virgin, a, a, a foot or so long, in, in, in a feed trough. Humble, lowly, lovable, loving, kind, good, perfect, powerful, but yet never using that power for himself. He used it for others. He, he used the very power of God to raise Lazarus from the dead and others. He healed the leper with that power. He did all good for all people but never for himself. He's not trying to... So, Pilate, you would have no power except God had given it to you. Particularly no power over me because I'm innocent. But God's given you power this time because I have to die. Now, I don't know that he got all that, but he understood that his power was limited by God. It was given him by God, but it was also limited by God. <clears throat> and then he says, Therefore, and this is it. Therefore, because of this, he says, uh, He that delivered me unto thee. I have not time to... It's Caiaphas. It's Caiaphas, the ruler of the religious sect, the ruler of the Jews that wanted to put him to death. The ones that delivered it all did it under the, the ruling of Caiaphas. So he says, Caiaphas has a greater sin than yours. So... The Lord here teaches Pilate and us that not all sins are the same. Not all sins have the same punishment as inferred to the greater sin. So, so Pilate, even though he's been given power by God to crucify an innocent man, particularly, that does not wipe away the sin it is still sin. You know, people say, well, what about Judas? Judas had to do what he did. No, he didn't. God knew he would do what he did, but he's guilty of that. He's the son of perdition. He, he is, you know, he, and he hanged himself for it. He knew it. Just because God allows people to do things that are wrong, gives them power to do things that are wrong, doesn't mean that it's not wrong. Or that they were forced to. God doesn't force these people to do it. He gives them the ability to do it. And then they do what they do. He gave Pilate the ability to crucify him. And Pilate crucified him. And it was a sin. But there is some sins worse than others. Pilate was ignorant. He didn't know all this stuff. He didn't have any you know, malicious intent against Christ. He had wished this day had never come. He had no interest in doing this. But he was, a, he was a coward is what it finally boils, boils down to. He was afraid that, that unless he did it, these Jewish people would rat him out to Caesar as though he was not loyal to Caesar because he let a guy who called himself a king and a god uh, unpunished. That he knew that they could, they could so construe that as to make Tiberius upset with him. And so he caved and he crucified. He was a coward. He had a good intention towards Christ, but he was a coward. 
There's a lot of people that have a good intention towards Christ. They like to read what he about what he did and what he said. They they love his sermon on the mount. They love how he healed lepers and how he opened the eyes of the blind and and he said good things and and they want to ignore the fact that he talked about hell a lot too. You know they they don't want to hear the the things that they judge are bad. There is no bad in him, but he talks about bad things and it's true. There's a lot of people that, that like to hear those things and talk about them and believe that they know them and all that kind of stuff. But ultimately, they're cowards. Because Jesus talks about those that would come after Him. He says, if you're going to come after Me and you don't hate your mother and your father and your sister and brother and yea, your, your, whole, your own life. He says, if a man would come after Me, he must deny himself. Take up his cross. It means die. It follow me. Don't you see that people talk about it? Oh, it's just so easy to be saved. Well, it's simple enough. It's just coming to Christ. It, it, it is finding Him, seeking Him. He says to seek. Seek and ye shall find. Knock. And the, people don't seek. People don't knock. People don't repent. But but coming to Him. You need to count the cost. He talks about that. You need to understand what you are going to have to die to sin. You're going to have to die to this world. You're going to have to die. See, you are the world. You're the sin. You, you are. Each one of us is. We, we are corporately the world. We are individually the world. We are worldly. We are men. And men are cursed of God because of sin. You are have to die. That, that inward man that is dead towards God has to die towards itself. It has to abandon itself with nothing but a hope and a prayer that God will lift you up in life in a second birth. You have to so seek after Jesus is to allow that spirit to draw you to such a point where you give up on your own self, your own life. All the things that your wicked heart fancies, they have to perish and become nothing but done to you that you might find Jesus. It's not a thing you can do of your own. God must work that. But He will not work it in the heart that always resists him. You have to yield. Pilate should have yielded. I hope Pilate yielded. I hope I don't have any reason to know if he did or not. I hope he did. I would not have anyone die in their sins, nor would the Lord. But they do. Most do. Most of the world dies in their sins for nothing. For, for, for the, the things of this world which perish. For happiness in a world that really doesn't understand what happiness is. Doesn't even know the first thing about true joy. That's for the living. Dead men don't have joy. Oh, here and there they like one thing. They get all excited about some possession or something or other. Some circumstance. But true joy comes from God. It's a thing that, that the worldling has never experienced, has no concept of. You think you're alive when you're a sinner. You're not. You're dead. You are dead in sin. Your heart knows nothing of life. Your body lives, but it's dying. Try getting to be a little bit old and you'll learn that. You don't know life until you know Christ. In Him is life. And, and, and the only source of life is Him. It comes by a union with Him. His, His Spirit, your Spirit, together, just as He touched a leper, His Spirit touches your heart. And wherever that living water flows, everything comes alive. You come to life by the flowing of the Spirit of God in your heart. It's like the wind, it says. That could also mean the Spirit, the Spirit, Breeze or whispers. The Spirit whispers to whom He will. You hear His voice. You cannot know where He came from or where He went to. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. To be born again, 
Jesus sends the Spirit. The Spirit works on your heart. When He saves you, you hear the voice of the Son of God and you live. And the Spirit moves off elsewhere. And He comes when you need Him to, but not every time you want Him to. He's not ever completely away from you. He dwells within you. But He's got other people that He's drawing. And, and you need to learn to live by faith. And so, after that wonderful joy that comes from the salvation of God, He backs off a little bit and you try to walk on your own just so He, just so he can teach you that you can't. That you can't do anything without Him. That the life that you now live is Christ. You're crucified with Him. Nevertheless, you live. But not you. That, that, that old you is dead. It's gone. You, you, you denied it. You gave it up in a hope of Christ. You're crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, you live. But not you. Christ lives in you through the Spirit. What a wonderful thing. But you don't have it. If you like Pilate and you have not submitted yourself to this. It says, And from thenceforth, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out saying, If this man, if you let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. And, and Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and he sat down in the judgment seat in a place uh, called the pavement, uh, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was the preparation of the Passover about the sixth hour. Now that's not Rome, that's not Jewish hours. This is Roman hours. So it's about nine o'clock uh, in the morning. I'm sorry. I don't know, I'm, I'm getting confused. We won't go. I'll just go on. He says, And he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. Now this is not an effort to have them pity Jesus. This is mockery. Once they got to Pilate with a fear that they would turn Caesar against him, he abandons all the things that Christ has done in his heart to draw him to salvation. And his love of the world, and his position in the world, and his possessions in the world... He is not about to lose those for something that just makes his heart troubled. Don't be like him. And so he mocks him. He says, Behold your king! Seeing this ragged man all bloodied. And they say, We have no king but Caesar. And he says, Then delivered he, Pilate, Christ, therefore unto them, to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led Him away. And we'll end it there. Thanks for your patience. God bless you. Bye-bye.